All right, we're live on Facebook and on Zoom. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is a CE National Digital Lab. My name is Eric Miller. I'm the host of these uh, digital labs, and I am also the Director of Ministry Operations with CE National. Uh, we have one of our own staff members here today. Uh, we've got Edward Short, uh, goes by Eddie, or uh, sh for short, Ed. Ed, awesome to have you. Hey, uh, thank you, Eric. It's really a joy to be with you today. Excited about what we're going to talk about. Yeah, we're going to be discussing why you need a ministry coach. Ed has been a uh, ministry coach. He's our primary, really our only ministry coach on uh, a consultant from for CE National. Uh, many of, of the people in the Caris Fellowship of Churches have uh, made use of Ed. It's been a blessing. I myself uh, for 17 years was a pastor in Frederick, Maryland. Uh, and Ed, what how long did we even do coaching for? It was a good... I think like, we probably I, coached for three to four years. Okay. I couldn't remember. Yeah. But it was great. I, I, I appreciated you and your role uh, as, a, as a ministry coach. We'll, we'll dive into that here today. Uh, but our goal is not just today to have uh, you sign up, our viewers sign up, uh, to have Ed coach them. So... Uh, we'll, we'll talk through why that would be of benefit maybe for, for some, uh, but he does have a, a good healthy workload. Uh, in addition to being our ministry coach and consultant with C National, Ed is also the lead pastor at Cross Point Church in York, Pennsylvania, uh, where he and his wife Carol reside. Uh, so Ed, good to have you on here. Tell us just a little bit or briefly about your, your role um, as being a coach and a consultant and even a pastor and kind of how God led you into this process. Well, Eric, I have been with CE for four year, for eight years now, and uh, over that time, probably coached over a hundred different pastors and ministries, and it really goes back to as uh, I came out of Grace Seminary, was a youth pastor for eleven years, saw God do some amazing stuff, and asked the question. Um, why aren't churches doing the kind of things that we're experiencing in the student ministry? Transitioned to become an executive pastor. Now, that means a whole lot of different things in a whole lot of different locations. That's, and they, that's an impressive jump, by the way, to go from being a youth pastor to an executive pastor. Not many people can do that. No, it, it, was, a, it was an interesting time. And um, I loved it. My responsibility was a fairly large church, church of uh, 1,500 people. I oversaw the staff team. And it was my responsibility to make them successful. And I was also in charge of mission and vision, and uh, which is a, something that's in my wheelhouse. I love that. I'm a strategist, a practitioner, coach, communicator, trainer. That, that's really who I am. And, and so I, I really sharpened my coaching skills by coaching staff people. And really what I do now it, as a coach and a ministry consultant is the very same thing that I did back then, which I'm convinced every staff, every church needs somebody like that. Now you might not be able to have that person on your staff team, but what if you could have somebody that was a fresh set of eyes? What if you could have somebody that could give you some ideas when you were stuck? Cause let's be honest, Eric, we all get stuck, right? There are no perfect pastors. And uh, I, I'm an idea guy. One of the things that, uh, that I tell guys that I coach, look, not all my ideas are good. I just don't know which ones are not good. You'll have to discern them. So uh, I, don't, I don't tell guys what to do. I give guys ideas as to what they could do. It's, it's a lot like uh, you and I were just talking before we went live about the NFL. And, and in the NFL, which I really hope does happen this season, in the NFL, there are on, on every team, there are 53 players. You know how many coaches are on every NFL team? At least 23. Now think about that. Are, are there 23 coaches because those guys really don't know how to play football? No. I mean, they were by far the best in their high school team. They were one of the best in their college teams. Now they've meet, they're living the dream. And, and yet they have 23 coaches, according to my math, that, that's one coach for every 2.3 players. What do they do? They help the players see what they wouldn't see. They help them to run the right plays. And the dual role that I play as, as a consultant, I try to really help the guys that I'm working with and the churches that I'm working with to really assess 
which I think is the key to ministry, assess what their ministry is really effective at and not effective at. Yeah. Uh, a lot of talk happens today, Eric, about vision. I love vision. But if you think you're a visionary and you're not good at assessment, you are never going to get there. And so I'll work through with them, thinking through where they are, where they need to go. That's the consulting factor. And then I'll try to coach them up to personally develop the skills necessary to really get where they need to go. So the benefit's really twofold. The benefit is the church or the youth ministry or whatever division the guy oversees, um, that improves. But the person also develops as a ministry leader. And really, the problem with ministry is that we work so much in the ministry, doing the day-to-day -day stuff, we don't have time to work on the ministry or developing ourselves. And then what happens is we make the same mistakes year after year after year after year. So that's really how I get into it. I'm passionate about churches and uh, pastors and love to have that opportunity to try to, to, to partner with them, to be a listening ear, because sometimes you just need somebody that you can just dump on in a safe fashion and go, you know, I'm really struggling with this. And it, cause sometimes I don't know if you've noticed this, Eric, but um, sometimes uh, I look at things in my ministry and I think, wow, that's a horrible thing. That's a nine on the Richter scale. I need somebody to go, dude, you need to lighten up. That's a three. It's not catastrophic. <laughs> and that, that's that just to have that person that can listen well, that's not emotionally involved in it really helps you to think through that and then to figure out, okay, what steps do I really need to take? Yeah. You could have somebody that could help you with that. I think it'd be amazingly good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Ed, that, that's amazing. I love hearing how God led you into this role. Um, I know firsthand from experience in our relationship of, of you being a coach with me and uh, that, that there is value in this uh, greatly. So, so uh, I want, I want to put that out there just to make sure that, you know, our viewers understand uh, this is not, we, we're not intending this to be a 45 minute long commercial uh, for, for CE National, but truly to dive deep. So our goal for this conversation it is to dive deep into what a ministry coach is and, and to, to have some thought provoking conversation uh, for our viewers to be able to think, you know what, I need, I need that. Uh, whether it's Ed or somebody else, uh, to, to realize I need that in my life and to understand the benefits of that. So uh, if you're a pastor of any kind, we want to equip you uh, to have a ministry coach and, and, and to begin to think through what that might look like. And so uh, we, we as CE National, we want to be a resource to you. Uh, we want to partner with local churches and, and help in that way. So uh, thank you, Ed, for joining me in this call. Uh, I want to make mention of a couple things. There is uh, if you're watching on Zoom, I know we've got a couple people on here. There's uh, a Q&A box. There's the chat box. If you have a question, drop your questions in that. And then if, you have, uh, if you're watching live on Facebook with us now and you have a question that you want to ask Ed, drop that in the comment box. We'll see it, uh, and I can, I can pitch that to Ed here, and uh, we'll dive in. All right, so uh, Ed, kind of for, for our viewers maybe who don't understand, when we say ministry coach, how do you define that? What, what is a ministry coach? Um, discipleship, right? There's this whole thing biblically. I, I've never been a fan of the word mentoring. Um, there's, to me, that's a secular word uh, that I'm going to teach you a trade. And yet biblically, we see the word disciple, be a disciple of Christ. Discipleship is a biblical principle. How is coaching a little bit different from that? And kind of how do we well, teach I, I think that, the, okay, the, the whole discipling piece is something that we need to do with every Christ follower. Every Christ follower needs to be discipled, right? The, the two key words of ministry, no matter what flavor of ministry you have, are really discipleship and evangelism. We've got to do really, really well with that, right? But coaching really is the idea of, um, as we're talking about it here, it, it's really the idea of coming behind somebody who's a leader, and on that one to 10 scale, if they're a five, it's saying, how can we help you become a six? If they're a six, how can we help you become a seven? What does that really look like? And sadly, 
you go away to Bible college, perhaps, maybe you go to seminary, maybe you work in a ministry as an intern, and now you're on your own. And I don't know what it was like for you, Eric, but I literally still remember the first Monday sitting in my office after I was hired thinking, okay, what do you do now? What do you, what do, you do now? What, what does it really look like? And, and then as I developed more into ministry, you, you run into challenges. Hard to believe, right? But you do. You run into challenges. And a ministry coach and consultant can help you to strategically think through what are the options. And they don't run your ministry, yeah. but they give you insight. Honestly, um, I'm pretty biased about this, but every, every pastor who is in a position that oversees other pastors ought to really coach them up. But that might not be their wheelhouse. So right. if you can find someone that, that that's their wheelhouse, that when you invest an hour, you walk away with a list of things that could improve your ministry. Now, that sounds scary, right? Because the last thing most of us want is a bigger list. Right. I don't know about your list, but my list tends to, to grow throughout the day. I'm thinking it started with 12 things. I knocked off four of them. But at the end of the day, I now have 18 things to do. It's a bad math equation. Don't understand how it works. But um, the kind of things that we're going to talk about as a, from a coach to a pastor would, would be things that are going to really aid you greatly in your ministry, make your ministry more effective, save you time. And, and to, to think through, like, like, what is it that I don't know right now? Because you and I and everybody that's listening or watching, we all have holes in our, in our thinking, in our mindset. And yeah. so, sadly, you get hired and all of a sudden you're the professional. You're the guy. And you don't have anybody that's inputting into your life to say, hey, have you thought about this? And I think that's what a coach does. A consultant, when I put that hat on, it's really looking at the effectiveness of an area of ministry and saying, how can we be more effective? Uh, let me give you an example. We, we, we're just, we're still in the midst of the COVID-19 thing. And when it first started and, and almost 95% of those of us in ministry, we thought, okay, we got to do a live stream somehow, whether it was Facebook, whether it was Zoom, whether it was YouTube, we were going to do some kind of live stream. And, and I think most of the pastors that I'm aware of, I think made a key mistake. You know what a mistake was? They thought I need a live stream so that we can continue to get the message out to our people. Mm. And that was a mistake. Mm. Um, you go, well, why was that a mistake? You have to do that. Sure you do. But think about this. What if you began to view that live stream opportunity as a potential second campus? If you were to try to launch a second campus, it would, a, a literal second campus, you got to get a building, you're probably going to rent. You got to have an extra worship guy. You got to have somebody who's going to do the kids ministry. You got to develop all the systems. But if you begin to view the live stream as a second campus, and if you can figure out how to do the connecting piece, because if you don't figure that piece out, you're just a TV preacher. That's all you really are. Mm -hmm. If you do that, you could develop a following of people that have never been to church. It's never, catch this, it's really important. It has never been easier to invite people to come to church. You know yeah. why? Because you just invite them to watch live stream. And, yeah. and it's never been easier for them to say, you know, I'll give that a shot. Because to walk into your building or my building, that's pretty risky for an unchurched person. He doesn't know what goes on in that building any more than you know what goes on in the Moose Lodge. Eric, you ever been into a Moose Lodge? No. You know why? You're going, why would I do that, right? That's what unchurched people think about your church. Why yeah. would I do that? So if we, can, if we can do that kind of stuff, then all of a sudden you're going, wow, we really could have a literal physical campus here where we're going to do the live gathering, and then we can do live stream over here. And some of these people will transition ultimately into the live gathering, but just maybe. 
just maybe one of the things God is doing is giving us an opportunity to expand our thinking and to say, you know what, not all ministry has to happen in our building over here. What if yeah. we could develop a, a second campus? So it's ideas like that that you get and you walk away and you go, you know, um, I need to really think about that. I need to bang that idea out with my team. And the guys that I've been working with, the vast majority of them have taken that idea and, and they have picked up a lot of people that are now connected to them that would not have been connected to them if they were just strictly going after quote unquote their people. Right. And I think, I think that's a great example uh, of what a ministry coach is and how, how you would help people think things through. And, and I can speak to that. I'll be uh, example number two, uh, because in our time of, of you being my, my ministry coach, I know you are one, a number one, you are passionate about the Lord and equipping people to do ministry. I saw that. Uh, anybody watching this now can feel that coming through the screen, right? Uh, but two, uh, you, you said it earlier, you are a strategic thinker. That is in your wheelhouse. Um, and so we need, you're exactly right, we need that. And it may not be the, the person that's my direct report as a youth pastor. It may not be the senior pastor at the church, you know, but those things are still important and needed and, and somebody to, to hold you accountable for sure, but somebody to also help equip you to, to think through things. And that's to me, the other piece that I think you're exceptional at is your, I've, I've said this uh, publicly and to your face before. So it's not anything you haven't heard me say, but you're one of the most strategic thinkers that I know. And I love that you say, I'm going to give you a lot of ideas. They may not be good ideas, but there might be one in there. It's your job to mine through them. And I think that's what a good coach does is to help you see things in a different perspective, to think outside the box, just like the example that you just gave. That's of such value to us as, as pastors, as ministry leaders, because sometimes we really do just need to put our frame of reference aside and think creatively outside of our context. And that then is to me the third piece that you offer where you're in conversation with so many other churches and pastors and leaders that for me, when I started doing small groups in Frederick, I was like, I, I, I know small groups on a student level in our youth ministry, and we did that really well. And you were one of the guys that helped me think outside of that box because you contacted, you know, you, you talked to so many other lead pastors, youth pastors alike, that you could offer insight and ideas. I remember even um, how, do, you know, I had a question of how do I train and equip leaders? You know, and I'd ask that question to anybody who would listen. Uh, and you were one of the guys that helped me kind of figure out a process, a system to put in place that would help equip our small group leaders and to create a path for them to run on. So to me, that, that is of great value. Uh, so I, I love that. I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, and even, even as you work through, kind of give us like, what's your template, um, you know, for somebody maybe that says, hey, uh, Ed, I'd like for you to coach me, or maybe they need to go to somebody that, uh, that is in their church or their circle of influence that they would like to be their ministry coach. What are some of those things that they need to have in place in order to have that ministry coaching model? That's a great question, Eric. I, I think the, the key thing you want to find in a coach is someone that philosophically agrees with you, right? Because they're going to lead you in a direction. So if, if you're not buying into the philosophy of ministry that they have, wrong coach for you. Then I think you want to find somebody who's a really good listener. It goes back to that assessment piece which most of us have not been taught how to assess. Right. We're not very good at it. We don't have the time, we don't think about it, because unless for each of us in the various areas of our ministries, we can define what a win looks like, mm -hmm. uh, we're not gonna assess properly. We walk out, like pastors sometimes, uh, you ever preach and you're going, that was really good? A and uh, afterwards you're thinking, maybe it wasn't all that good. Did I communicate well? Yes. But, but is, life gonna, is life change going to happen because of that? Maybe not. 
Mm. And, and so assessment, you need somebody who, one of the things I'll do is, is I, I will, um, with guys that want it, and I always let the guy that I'm working with uh, lead us after we get through some basic systems that we have to talk about. Um, if he doesn't want to, for me to help him assess his preaching ability, we won't do that. Because let's face it, that's a scary thing to do, right? You got to have trust to be able to do that. Yeah. Because I don't know about you, Eric, but when I watch myself preach, I'm going, oh, I can't believe I did that, right? <laughs> you know, you just go, ah, that's, I didn't say that very well. But, but if I were to watch you preach or you were to watch me preach, you could assess and you'd see things I don't see. And then if, if I were to uh, help you to think through like everybody that's watching this video, my assumption is you want to see people from your town, your region, your city, your area come to know Jesus, right? Um, and most of us are frustrated because we're not seeing that at a high enough level. Hmm. And we talk a lot about life on life ministry. And I think that's amazingly important. But if you're in a church of a hundred people, and if you got a hundred adults and each of them would be interested in seeing their friends come to know Jesus. And let's say that they say, you know, I got three friends that don't know Jesus. I'm going to really, for the next two years, plug my life into them. I'm going to care for them. I'm going to share what God's doing in my life with them. Eventually, I'm going to challenge them about following Jesus. At, at the end of two years, we could maybe see a hundred people come to know Jesus. Now, we know that's not going to happen, right? I mean, not everybody comes to know Jesus. But yeah. potentially you could reach a hundred people that way. But yeah. what if you've had somebody who said, Hey, what if you fished in a bigger pool? What if you realize this is the small pool that you could fish in? There's a hundred people potentially there, but what if you could fish in this bigger pool over here? And honestly, that idea that I just shared with you about using the live stream idea came out of fishing in this bigger pool. Cause yeah. there are people, whether you're in Philadelphia, York, Pennsylvania, Akron, somewhere in Indiana, somewhere in California, somewhere in Florida, there are people that need to know Jesus, right? And, and we got to figure out how to reach them. And just putting our name out there isn't going to do it. So to be with someone who could practically help you to think through ideas that you didn't have, there, there really are, uh, honestly, there, there's a couple of uh, there's a couple of fields of thought about coaching. The one field of thought is I'm going to just ask you a lot of good questions, and Eric, you're going to come up with all the answers. And I'm thinking, Eric, you're a smart guy. You don't need me to ask you questions. If you could come up with the right answers, we wouldn't need to be having this conversation. Like, don't you want to be with somebody that's going to be throwing stuff out and going, Hey, what if you did this? Hey, what if you did that? Hey, and, and one of those, Hey, what if you did the light goes on in your head and you go, that's it, man, I'm going to do that. And then you work with that coach and he goes, okay, so what would that look like? Let's develop it. So I don't just throw ideas out. I'll throw ideas out until we land like we did with the small groups piece. And then we'll say, now let's develop the process of what that would look like. So I think you want a guy who buys into your philosophy of ministry, who listens well so they can assess well, who is an idea person, and then is somebody who understands systems and can strategize. In other words, um, this uh, being a coach is, is not just giving you principles. They have to have a practitioner's mindset. They have to think like, okay, we're at point A, we need to get to point B. Here are the four steps that we need to take. So expand on that thought there a little bit, because I know that that mission vision piece, you're super passionate about helping not only pastors, but churches to develop that as well. Uh, and, it, and if we're honest, there's a lot of churches that, that maybe get those confused or that, that don't have a good mission, vision, you know, they, they, you know, forgive me, but they, they just say something, you know, churchy and nobody really knows what that means. And it's right. not well defined to know if you're making progress. So kind of what do you offer as a, a ministry? That's a person? great question. I, I think you have to, first of all, really define those terms because they're a little bit confusing. Uh, mission really is what every church, every ministry is called to do. Basically say it any way you want. It's making disciples who make disciples who make disciples. 
Right. It's uh, at, at my church, we talk about connecting people to Jesus in a simple life-changing way, mission statements. Okay. The problem with mission statements is most of the time we spend a lot of time developing the statement. We, we crunch the words and we file it away or we put it on the bull in the bulletin or on the wall someplace. We yeah. might even recite it every week. We just don't practice it. Mm-hmm. And, and that's called what a way we should be doing. Yes. What yeah. we should be doing. Exactly. So, so now we have this picture uh, of the, the mission statement that says we're going to go north. We're not going east. We're not going west. We're not going south. We're going to go north. All right. That's great. But it's still fairly nebulous. It, it gives you direction, but it doesn't tell you what you do. Then there's this thing called the vision statement, uh, which really is a misnomer. Um, it, it's not a statement. It really isn't. It, the vision is how we, as this ministry, ministry A, church A, how we are going to fulfill our mission. I, I'm going to do it differently than your church, and, and your church is going to do it differently than their church. But there's going to be some components in there that are key. For instance, if you want to really have a mission statement being fulfilled, and your mission statement is something about making disciples who make disciples, you got to do certain things well, right? You got to reach lost people, really important. Mm-hmm. And honestly, most, most churches are not doing an effective job at that. Mm-hmm. So you got you got to you got to reach lost people. You you then got to teach the Christ followers what it really looks like to follow after Jesus. You also have to really work hard at connecting people to each other because you can't you can't really grow spiritually by listening to the radio or reading John MacArthur's commentary. I mean there's more to it than that. Uh, or going to Bible college. I, I mean, there, it's it's not, there's the connection piece. That's why I think small groups are a vital part. As as a communicator, as, as somebody who loves to preach, um, I wish that life change could happen in the auditorium. Wouldn't it be great? I preach this amazing sermon. People go, wow, I've never heard anything that amazing. I'm going to raise my hand, sign a card, walk an aisle, do something. My life's going to change. It just doesn't happen that way. It happens when people do life on life with each other. And, and so yeah. that connecting piece, really, really important. And then there's yeah. two other components that you have to have in that vision piece. You have to have the equipping piece, which I call coaching, coaching in a different realm, coaching ministry workers. Mm-hmm. When, what do you think, Eric, the average person thinks about when they think about ministry in in the local church how do you think they the average person defines ministry serving yeah serving and it's probably serving in a program right yeah what if what if in all of the churches that are that we're connected with what if they began to redefine ministry as one person significantly impacting Mm -hmm. one other person and 90 percent of the ministry happened out there not in our building true that is a game changer. You know why that's not going to happen? Two reasons. One, past most of us as pastors, we've not been taught to think that way. Mm-hmm. And then we don't equip or coach people with life on life ministry skills. Mm-hmm. So if you if your people aren't doing evangelism effectively, some of that has to rest on your shoulders. You've got to you've got to throw the you got to cast the nets out there, cast the vision. And then you got to equip them and coach them with practical things. Like, yeah, I, I'm pretty biased about evangelism. I do think it's a process. I think the key to evangelism is listening, not speaking. Now, you do have to talk at some point. Mm-hmm. But if you just learn a canned approach to evangelism, it's not going to work. But if you could listen to people's heart needs, and then you can bring Jesus into that, mm-hmm. um, it could be amazing. Why don't people do that? Nobody's ever taught them. Nobody's ever equipped them, which takes you to places like Urban Hope. Urban Hope, one of the great things about Urban Hope is it's a practice field event. Yeah. At Urban Hope, you could take people there and they could be there for a weekend or they could be there for five days and they will learn these principles. And all those principles they're going to learn there are transferable back to your home church. That's beautiful. Yeah. That whole equipping piece is part of the vision and then developing leaders. Um, most churches don't develop leaders. 
and, and so at least those five things have to be part of the vision. And then you think through, okay, if we're going to do that, maybe stewardship has to be part of the vision. We've got to finance this thing somehow. Most of us as pastors are way too leery about talking about money. And I'm saying, hey, um, let's give people the opportunity to invest in something that's going to outlive them. And then you got, okay, uh, maybe you, got, you say, hey, if we're going to do this, we will reach families. We better have a kids ministry that not only ministers to kids, but ministers to parents. And then, Eric, I know you and I are still passionate about student ministry. So maybe that has to be part of it. And you just think through, that becomes the vision. And then, you know what you talk about in your elder team meetings? Those things. You know what we wind up talking about in our elder team meetings? A lot of other stuff. Yeah, and, buildings and meetings. And yeah, I, I'm pretty convinced that most of our elder teams could cease to meet for six months and nobody would notice the difference. Yeah. Because the kind of stuff we talk about doesn't move the ball down the field because we're not talking about what are the wins this month that we need to really hit. So mission, big picture, going north, vision. Yeah. Okay, what are the key things that we need to do and what would it look like for us to get there? Yeah. All right. So Ed, that, that's helpful to know, to kind of understand. Uh, so let's say that, you know, somebody's watching this and they're like, Hey, I'm, I'm interested uh, in, in being coached by Ed. What, what can they expect? Uh, what do they do to sign up to connect with you? What does okay. that process look like? Yeah. Real, real simple. Uh, shoot me an email, Ed short S H O R T at cenational.org and say, hey, I'm interested uh, and I and give me your phone number, I'll call you, we'll talk about it. Um, the initial phases are absolutely no cost, won't cost you a thing, okay? Will not cost you one thing. If we do a long-term thing or deeper dives, um, you know, we would ask you to help support the cost of that, but initially, no cost. We don't do this to make money. We do this because we're passionate about pastors and we're passionate about churches. So that's how you'd sign up. Um, I would then send you um, a form to fill out just to help me to get to know you we, because that assessment piece is really important. And we would begin to Skype or Zoom on a monthly basis, probably for a 60 minutes to 90 minutes at a shot. And at the end of the 60 to 90 minutes, we'd agree on, hey, you got to take these three steps. I don't force you to take those three steps. You decide, hey, I'll take those or I'll take two of the three. Okay, fine. That's great. Then we'll talk about those the next time we get back together and we'll keep moving the ball down the court. We might find that you go, you know, um, I, I'm not really good at one of the areas I need to be good at. Okay, we'll spend a lot of time then yeah. walking on developing that area. So that's the personal side. Um, there are two other things that, that I do that we would throw out as an opportunity to anybody that's listening or to any church that you're aware of. Sometimes churches go through a crisis and, and they need somebody from the outside to come in and help them. Um, we have begun to specialize in doing that because yeah. churches face crises all the time and an outside voice can really help to walk through that issue, whatever it is. Maybe there's conflict in the church. Maybe there's been some kind of catastrophic something or other situation that's happened. So we do that. The other area that's become a real strong point for us is if your church is in pastoral transition, the average church has a rather poor process of finding the next person. It's almost like they're just gonna go to Walmart and go to aisle four and, you know, halfway down on the left, you know, about three quarters of the way up, you can just pick a pastor. It doesn't work that way. And so we've begun to develop a process that takes nine months, 12 months uh, to get the next person where we'll assess where the church is at, work with the leadership team to think about where you want to take the church. And then now here comes the magic piece of this. Now you understand where the church is. You understand where the church wants to go. Now we're going to help you find the person that can help you, help you, notice that phrase, to get from here to here. Sometimes churches hire the wrong guy and he wants to go here and you want to go there. That's why pastors last two years. It yeah. doesn't work. So that, that's sort of what it looks like. Um, there's a relationship piece uh, as we get to know each other. Um, 
it be, we create a safe environment where you can tell me anything and I'm not going to go, Oh my, um, you know, I've pretty much been around long enough that I've seen it all. You're not going to tell me anything. I'm going to go, never seen that before. <laughs> and so we'll work really hard with you. And, and honestly, um, every, every pastor that I work with, it's different. There's not a template like, uh, you know, hey, month one, we'll do this. Month two, we'll do that. I have a lot of ideas as to what we need to cover, but we're going to tailor all of that to where you're at, where your church is at. I, I love that. And I, even as I'm, you know, recounting our time together in, in that coaching relationship, um, that's that's very accurate because I know there were times where, um, you know, we were, as our church was in transition, that uh, I needed to process. I'm a verbal processor, so I need somebody uh, outside of our ministry context to talk things through, to have those fresh ideas. You're a guy that's well connected in other churches, and so you could offer some of those. It's like I, I got the opportunity to speak to 30 other pastors, all because you talked to 30 other pastors. So, right. Um, right. And, and at the same time, there were those times where I'm like, Ed, I just need to vent. And you would listen and, and pray for me and talk me off the ledge or whatever it might be. And, and so I appreciate that. I know that's that, that was super. Those kind of things are super important because um, I, I can be a safe voice uh, for, you, for you to speak to. Because, you know, if every pastor gets frustrated, can we be honest? Every pastor gets frustrated. You don't want to go to your elder team and go, hey, guys, I'm really frustrated again. <laughs> I mean, you just don't want to do that. Yeah. But if you can have a, a, a safe person to talk to, they can not only be an effective listener, which is really good, and, yeah. and I work really hard at being empathetic and listening well, and, 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 but then I, I've got to then give you some direction and go, Eric, um, I, I'm not sure you're thinking well on this thing. Or Eric, you are absolutely right. We need to come up with a plan to address that so it's not just the venting venting is important right but but there's more to it than that we want to give opportunities for people to go all right so that's the issue and what am i going to do about it now if i find out there's cancer how do we fix it yes and i've experienced both of those in in our ministry relationship and in that coaching um i, I think the the thing i want to zero in on that is um it's super important to have a ministry coach, somebody that, that you can connect with that, that you know is, is for you. They're going to help you strategically think things through. They're going to help you map out, uh, develop systems that, that you can implement on a track that you can run on, whatever scalability you need in your role in ministry. But the other pieces, and, and this I know that you're, you're good at doing too, um, and we'll, we actually have talked about doing another digital app on this topic in the future. Um, but how do you help the, the youth pastor, the senior pastor to build those relationships within their team? Because that's needed too. So, you know, to our viewers, we're not saying, you know, you need a ministry coach because you should never talk to your, your team right. about these things. Right. That, please don't hear us in that. I, right. I know I'm speaking for you on that. Yeah. Uh, but that's Absolutely. the goal is both. Okay. I, yeah. And, and I think part of the answer to that is, and I've been in, uh, I've done ministry now for 34 years and uh, there've been times I've been the solo guy. There's been other times I've had a staff of 24 people. Um, here's what I've learned. You don't treat everybody the same, just like with your kids, right? Every kid that you're going to have, I've had, uh, they have certain strengths and weaknesses and I can't treat them all the same. I have to understand where they're at. And as a leader, my grid is I am going to shift how I oversee them based on who they are. I'm not expecting them to shift based on who I am. Yep. I think that's a key issue to wrestle through. Um, I have to know my staff well enough. What's going to encourage them? What's going to discourage them? And uh, an example of that is in, in my church uh, years ago, I had a, a worship guy who said, you know, when, whenever I, I leave talking to you, I feel really depressed. Well, that got my attention. <laughs> I'm going, that's not good. You know, what, why, why is that? And, and he just was not used to anybody going, hey, um, you know, when that happened, that wasn't good. Mm -hmm. And so I had to be more delicate 
in how I could approach that with him. Other times there's people that if I'm delicate, they don't get it. That, you know, as the lead pastor, uh, I, I, or as a youth pastor speaking to my team, my volunteer team, sometimes I got to go, Hey, whoa, whoa, time out. You know, we're supposed to be investing time in students and honestly, we're not. And then they're going to go, well, we don't have time. And I'm going to go, no, you do have time. You're just not thinking correctly. Look, the average, the average youth volunteer thinks, okay, if I'm going to invest time with a, with a student, I have to do something special with them. No, you don't. You know, you go, hey, what are you going to do? I, I'm going to be uh, working, putting a fence up in my backyard. You know, if that's called free labor, Eric, I'm going to invite a student to come over and we're going to put the fence up together. And while we're putting the fence up together, you know what's going to happen? Ministry. Yep. You know, those are some key things that, that you, we, you have to understand who you're working with, whether it's a student, whether it's an, an adult volunteer for the student ministry, whether it's a staff person, whether you're here and the lead pastor's here. You, you have to understand how he thinks, right? You should know that yeah. because uh, sometimes you get guys who are, are in this position up here and they're super detailers. And when they give you something, they want it to look exactly like that. Okay. Well, then if you don't agree with that, you have to have that conversation early. Otherwise, it's not going to go well. On the other hand, there are some guys that are just going to give you the big picture. And if you can't figure out the details, then that's going to be a problem. A coach could help you to figure out what those details really are. The beauty of it is at the end of the day, Eric, no matter what anybody brings to the table as far as how they think and process and what their abilities are, um, a good coach can work with them and help them to move down the process of going from a six to a seven, a seven to an eight, an eight to a nine. And let's be honest, there aren't any tens. If you think you're a 10, you're lying. Okay. So, but we could really help you to, to improve uh, as a leader and then as you prove as a leader, the ministry benefits greatly. Yeah, yeah. Well, Ed, we had a, a question come in of, of somebody that said, I'm not interested myself uh, in coaching, but, but I know someone who, who might be. Um, what, can, what, can, what would you encourage them to do? In, yeah, in uh, same process. Have them shoot me an email. Um, okay. Ed Short, S-H-O-R-T, at cenational.org. And say, hey, heard about your coaching, consulting stuff. Love to chat with you. And even if they're not signing up, if they make that, if they shoot that email over. And, and I would even say, yeah, send, send them the link to this video, right? Yes, yeah, exactly. Send them the link, let them watch it. And they'd go, you know, I, I'd like to talk about that. And then um, I, I never try to oversell what we're doing when I'm talking to guys. Because, uh, you know, my plate's pretty full. I don't need one more guy. But... I would like to offer that because the beauty of, of what I do, Eric, is um, if I'm quote unquote just a pastor, which is fine, um, you know, I can, I can minister to this many people on a Sunday, but if I can coach 25 guys who each have a hundred people in their church who are each trying to reach 400 people, that's 10,000 people that, that I get a chance to influence. That's what I wake up in the morning yeah. wanting to do. Yeah. Well, and I would love, you know, to see this, this ministry thrive where, where, you know, if we had so many people who said, Hey, we need ministry coaching as well, where CE could continue to be a resource and we multiply guys like you to invest in others. And and that could be a really cool thing too. So, um, Ed, one, one last question, just what are other resources that you know of that might be available that are kind of in line with this, uh, equipping process that, that, maybe we can make available to people. Okay, sure. Uh, let me begin to answer that by saying this. For 20 years, I worked with Sun Life Ministries as a trainer, did advanced training with them. Started out in the student ministry section, then we went church-wide and, and did that. Advanced training with, with pastors that would last for like a week, and then they'd come back a year later on another week. One That's of the things that, that, S-O-N, right? Yeah, Sun, Sun Life, yes. S-O-N. Yes. Uh, one of the things that, that we recognized is just going to a conference or a training thing like that gives you notes. It doesn't necessarily change the way you do ministry. 
So yeah. it's good to do that. I, you know, find a conference that, you know, you got you got questions about small group, find a great small group conference and go to it. But when you come home, yeah. you got to have somebody that you can talk to about that. Uh, Pastorpedia, to toot our own horn uh, with CE National, gives great insight, great insight. But if you just watch that and don't do anything with it or bounce it around with your leadership team or with a ministry coach, how do I uh, plug this in? It's probably going to be a waste. I want to give uh, anybody that's listening uh, a website. There is uh, the guy that is the live stream expert with Saddleback. His name is Jay Cranda, K-R-A-N-D-A, jcranda.com. Uh, um, he's amazing. Hmm. If you're wrestling through how do we live stream, what do we need to know, um, how do you connect with people, I, I mean, it's going to feel like drinking from a fire hose, but you're going to get so much stuff from him. And then if you can talk to somebody and say, hey, how do we apply that? How do I apply that? It's those kinds of things. So I guess the key of what I'm saying is lots of stuff out there, uh, a lot of podcasts like this one, but let's be honest, this podcast isn't going to change your life. But if you could talk to somebody about a principle that you learned here, it could really change your life. Yeah, that's so good. Well, thank you, Ed, for joining us and being a part of this conversation. I know um, that, that I value you in this relationship. And uh, I, I just, I want so many other people to have that experience. And so that's my heartbeat. Um, I know that, that this is a way that we can uh, hopefully leverage and encourage people to, to pursue that. And again, whether it's with you or somebody else, we don't care. We, we, right. value, the, we value that, uh, that relationship of, of being effective in ministry. And these are key principles that we've identified that will help you to do that uh, in that process. So uh, again, if there's anything that we can do, please reach out to us at CE National. Uh, we would be happy to help uh, you in, in your role in ministry to be effective uh, and to be on mission. And so uh, we want to help with that. So thank you, Ed, for joining me in this conversation. Uh, why don't you just pray for our viewers and, and pray for those, those relationships and coaching development? That's great. Father, thank you for the good things you want to do in each of our lives. I pray for the pastors that are uh, watching this podcast. And God, I pray that you'd refresh them today. And I pray that you'd give them insight into the next steps they need to take to develop personally as a leader and the next steps their ministry needs to take so that that ministry um, would be incredibly effective and fruitful. God, today, those of us that are pastors, it's easy for us to think about ministry as just our church. Help us to see people today the way you see them, and especially help us to see unchurched people the way you see them, and put a passion on our hearts that we wouldn't just talk to, quote unquote, our people about evangelism, but we would actively be involved in the evangelism process, life on life, with at least three people that we know. God, I just pray that today you would come behind each person that's listening and remind them you have a plan for them to help fulfill the Great Commission. And your son said that he would go with them and he would give them power to accomplish that. And for that, we're really grateful today. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.